the UK tax burden has increased to the highest level since 1948. In the past three decades, the burden has risen from 28% to 37% of GDP, and it will continue to rise with a typical householder expected to pay an extra £650 a year. However, whilst in 1948 the government was setting up the NHS and welfare state, 2023 has seen record waiting lists and public services under pressure like never before. Why have we ended up with paying higher tax but deteriorating public services? Is it bad luck, bad management or bad decisions? In the post-war period, the UK economy was growing at an average of 2.5% a year. Not spectacular by international standards, but it was enough to enable growing public sector spending without increasing the tax burden. But in 2007, that started to change. The UK experienced a sharp fall in economic growth, and since 2016 has performed much worse than our main competitors. This anemic growth means that the government receives much less tax than expected. The Financial Times report that if UK growth had been maintained at pre-crisis levels, the average person would be a staggering £10,000 a year better off, and forecasts for 2023 and beyond remain very pessimistic for the UK. However, whilst tax revenues have fallen, our demand for healthcare continues to rise. An ageing population, the effects of Covid, a rise in long-term sickness, new expensive treatment. And this rise in healthcare spending is on top of a growing pension bill which has soared in recent years because of more old people and the triple lock pension guarantee. Furthermore, high house prices and rents have also caused more pressure on housing benefit. To try and fill this fundamental funding shortfall, the government has tried to trim other budgets, like sticking multiple plasters on a growing wound. 2010-16 to 16 saw a decrease in many government spending on departments such as education and public sector investment. It also led to a public sector falling behind the private sector. Nurses have seen a 10% fall in real income and 20% less growth than private sector pay. However, all this trimming at the edges place more long-term pressures on the system. The impact of COVID, combined with these long-term funding cuts, stretched the system to breaking point, leading to the uh, concerning rise in waiting lists that we see now. It has caused a slower growth in life expectancy than expected. The big question is, why is economic growth much slower? Well, there are many reasons suggested. Firstly, the UK has seen a decline in previously strong industries. In the 1980s, the UK received a GDP and tax bonanza from North Sea oil. Adjusted for inflation, the government received around £18 billion a year. But this strength of oil led to a strong pound and really hurt manufacturing export industry. In the 1980s, the government also received a one-off bonus from privatisation. But unlike, say, Norway, this was not invested in public sector investment or sovereign wealth fund, but was used to cut the tax burden. And whilst there was talk of an economic miracle in the 1980s, there was a considerable amount of good fortune that would prove temporary. In recent years, oil revenues have declined as North Sea oil has uh, gone past their peak output, and this decline has been affected in GDP and tax revenues. The boon of privatisation receipts has also declined to a trickle. Furthermore, the 2007 credit crunch particularly affected the UK finance industry, which is a traditionally a major contributor of tax revenues, since so many people are high earners. But post-2007, the UK economy has definitely struggled with a decline of its major industries of oil, finance, and also a continued weakness in manufacturing. Other reasons for the low growth in the UK include the austerity of the 2010s. There is a strong link between uh, austerity and lower growth because cuts in government spending were generally not replaced by a booming private sector. In the 2010s, the pessimism of austerity contributed to lower growth, lower investment and lower competence. 
but you could say the real problem started in 2016, at least compared to other countries' growth. Firstly, the uncertainties of Brexit, changing trade rules, and then COVID hit business investment very hard. Whilst other countries recovered, the UK didn't. In 2021, the UK left the single market, and it was replaced with a hard Brexit, which has disrupted trade much more than many business ever expected. The new custom rules, regulations and cost of trade have hit small and medium-sized business in particular. And it's not just the higher barriers to trade, but the sense of constant change and uncertainty. Critics argue government policy has been prone to flip-flopping, a situation which reached a peak in last September's budget of Truss and Quateng. The radical budget of borrowing to finance tax cuts for the rich was rejected by the public, but perhaps more importantly, it was rejected by markets. Interest rates soared as the UK government's borrowing looked suddenly much less appealing. And though nearly all of the budget has been reversed, it is not without damage to the UK's reputation. And it definitely made the government tread a more cautious path in limiting the amount of its borrowing because it feared that rise in bond yields, which we saw in September. And this rise in interest rates is a key reason why the government have had to increase taxes, despite the political costs. But it's important to stress it's not just these short-term problems. Other long-term problems in the UK economy include things such as the planning system, which makes it easy to block or at least for delay the building of housing and investment projects. It means there is a shortage of housing and office space in key regions of economic development, such as London, Manchester, Cambridge and Oxford. Projects like HS2 and the expansion of Heathrow Airport are perhaps symbolic of UK investment projects. They take so long to get permission and agreement that costs tend to escalate and in the end, they have to become scaled back or cancelled. We could contrast this with France and European countries who generally have quicker planning schemes and can get big projects built quicker. And the elephant in the room for the UK economy is Brexit. The cost of Brexit may not always be top of a political agenda, but business have definitely struggled with a sharp rise in paperwork, costs and uncertainty. The OBR forecast, the UK has lost 4% of GDP from the impact of Brexit. Not a major recession, but more like a a slow long-term puncture. The Centre for European Reform claimed the loss of GDP is closer to 5.5%. The impact of Brexit can clearly be seen in the shock to business investment from 2016, which has never recovered. This is a unique decline of a key factor that determines long-term economic growth. The Brexit-induced devaluation of a pound also led to higher import prices, cost-push inflation, and exacerbated the rise in oil and gas prices during 2022. The UK economy used to be an economy reliant on free trade and an open economy. But Brexit marks a fundamental shift, with the OBR stating there has been a 15% fall in export-import penetration, which reflects how barriers to trade with our nearest traded partner have not been replaced uh, with trade from non-EU countries such as Australia or the United States. On top of these problems, there are also structural problems with the UK labour market. It currently is a curious mix of labour shortages and falling real wages. Textbook economics suggests that labour shortages that the UK is facing should push up real wages, but this has not happened yet. With inflation at 10% and very low productivity growth, workers have seen the biggest fall in real wages for decades. And this decline in real incomes has been magnified for public sector workers. Another area of concern in the labour market is the decline in labour participation rates. This is particularly an issue for older workers who are increasingly leaving the labour market due to rising ill health or plans for early retirement. The UK, like many other Western economies, is facing an ageing population, 
which will get significantly worse in the next few decades, but dependency ratio will almost double. And this is a concern for the future, with less young workers with the necessary qualifications to fill labour vacancies. And this shortage of labour is another friction for business and a discouragement to uh, expansion and investment. The impact of all these factors has been to cause record low levels of productivity growth, which is output per worker. Now, productivity has fallen across the world, not just the UK, perhaps reflecting lower growth in technology. But the UK's productivity growth has still been relatively bad. Another concern is that in the short term, the UK may struggle to adjust to the to ending the era of ultra-low interest rates. For around 13 years, we got used to interest rates close to zero. And this was a key factor in pushing house prices and house price to income ratios to record levels. But the arrival of unexpectedly high inflation has caused a sharp rise in interest rates, which are causing mortgage payments as a percentage of income to get close to levels last seen before 1991 and 2007 house price crash. The higher interest rates will catch many people out, especially when they have to get a new fixed rate deal later in the year and find out how much costs have gone up. And this could cause a significant fall in house prices, which will only add to more negative pressures on the UK economy. Looking for better news, uh, more optimism, there has been a substantial fall in oil and gas prices since last summer. And this is important for the UK because gas is by far the most important source of heating for households. Lower gas prices will help reduce inflation and also reduce the costs of the government as energy price guarantees will become cheaper than predicted. It is one reason why government borrowing has come in at a lower levels than expected. Secondly, if inflation does fall rapidly to 2%, as some predict, or perhaps hope, it will enable a reduction in interest rates and the lower inflation will also bring to an end the period of falling real wages, which would be very welcome. However, whilst these temporary factors will be very welcome, they do not start to address the long-term issues facing the UK economy. It's not just Brexit and Covid and oil price shocks. It's the low levels of investment, decline in manufacturing. It's the demographics low investment, low productivity, planning regulations, lack of skilled workers. All these create real problems for the UK economy in the long term. Now, the good news is that because growth has been so bad in recent years, in theory, it should be possible to catch up and there should be scope for uh, a surge in growth. But at the moment, it is hard to see that because there's so many uh, negative factors all weighing down on the UK economy. If you found this video useful, please give it a thumbs up and you might enjoy this video on the extent to which UK house prices are overvalued.